What up? What up? Students, a little rattled this evening as I was uh, going to pay my bills. I saw that $100 was taken out of my checking account today at one of the branches of my bank, yet I did not go to my bank today. So <clears throat> I don't know what's going on. So I'm going to try to stay upbeat. <laughs> I hope that someone isn't, uh, you know, accessing my account via fraud. Uh, I will have to deal with this in the morning because a stupid bank isn't open past five o'clock when I actually went online to look. So I don't know. I'm just rattled. Uh, you know, technology today, people can steal your information and hopefully I'm okay. I don't want thousands of dollars of my money. I may end up on the street if that occurs, but I'll try to be as positive as possible for you. So principles of the constitution. Uh, we talked about a lot of these principles throughout the last week or so. Um, and I just wanted to kind of summarize them so that you are clear in these overarching principles that are inherent in our democracy, our representative democracy, our republic. And these principles uh, were well thought out to alleviate some of the concerns that different factions or groups of people had in regards to the drafting of our current constitution. As we talked about today in many of our classes, separation of powers is one of the key components to convince the doubters that the Constitution, this new Constitution that will replace the Articles of Confederation, uh, will protect citizens, the government, so that one interest does not become all powerful. So you have a separation of powers between the three branches of government at least at the federal level, the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. And by separating those powers, uh, you make it so it's very, very difficult for one particular part of government to take total control. It's somewhat ingenious uh, in regards to that. Let me see if this is on here. Okay, it's not. And even you slice one of the three branches the legislative branch into a bicameral structure with the Senate and the House, which furthermore makes it more difficult for one branch of government to kind of control all of public policy. So this ensures the support primarily of anti-federalists, but certainly there are others who are really concerned about the government at the federal level becoming too strong and certainly in the hands of one small group of individuals. Checks and balances is another way in which we can kind of uh, alleviate or ensure that one branch doesn't become powerful. So you have infused this series of checks and balances, which I have another screencast, which I won't have to redo from the fall. Uh, you have these series of checks and balances. Some are bigger than others. Obviously, I talked today in both, well, most of my classes in regards to the big checks, and I'll talk about them uh, during this section. But this is a series of restraints on the branches of government, which ensures that one branch doesn't become all powerful. And I'm sure they put a lot of thought into regards to what checks and balances would be in place between the three branches. Um, and again, some are bigger than others. Legislative branch, clearly the biggest check is power of the purse, money. The legislative branch allocates money for all of the entities or all of the departments that carry out laws in the executive branch. So if the legislative branch does not agree with what some of the departments in the executive branch do, then they may cut funding, which essentially ends the ability of that department in the executive branch to carry out the law. Obviously, there's a lot of negotiations between the two branches to ensure that we are able to carry out the law 
in a very functional way. We talk about a veto, the ability of the president to veto a piece of legislation. That's a big power for the president. Uh, the ability to kind of force Congress to at least compromise on some things in regards to public policy, passing of laws. So if Congress knows that the president is ultimately going to veto a piece of legislation, and believe you me, the executive branch lets them know when the president would veto, um, this is going to lead to some conversation between the two branches of government, especially when we have a divided government as we do now where the legislative branch is Republican, the executive branch obviously is a Democrat. The <clears throat> legislative branch can override a veto, but that's very difficult to do. As you know, it's a supermajority. You need a two thirds vote in both chambers of Congress, both the House and the Senate. Uh, right now, for example, if the Republicans passed a bill that said, and this is hypothetical, that we're going to build a wall uh, between the United States and Mexico, and the president vetoed that bill, it's very unlikely that you're going to have two-thirds of both the House and the Senate agree to override that veto because the Republicans do not have a two-thirds majority. They have a majority, but not quite a supermajority of two-thirds. So a veto override is very difficult <clears throat> and very uncommon. Appointment and confirmation. Uh, the president gets to appoint to a few positions. Uh, most importantly, the judiciary. The president appoints judges not only to the Supreme Court, but the courts at the federal level that are underneath the Supreme Court. And that is confirmed by the Senate. Again, the Senate does all of the confirming in the legislative branch of executive decisions. Think of it this way. The Senate must approve what the president does in regards to appointments, treaties, etc. The House, H-O-U-S-E, does not have an A in it. The Senate, S-E-N-A-T-E, -E, has an A. A for approve. The Senate approves. Both confirmation of justices heads of the executive departments, um, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, Secretary of Agriculture. All of those are approved by the Senate. Treaties are also approved by the Senate. So when the president has a formal treaty with another country, it is approved by the Senate. Uh, funding we talked about today earlier in this screencast as well. Commander in chief, the president can send the troops overseas. This is one of those areas where it's unclear what the framers intended, whether they intended the legislative branch to have more power or the executive branch to have more power. The executive is commander in chief, controls the military. The legislative branch has the ability to declare war. Is sending troops declaring war? No, not necessarily. So there, there is some uh, unclear interpretation of what the framers wanted in regards to military uh, and the sending of the military into combat. We have not had a formal declaration by the Congress since World War II. There is some independence with the, within each branch in regards to political appointments. And again, we talked about the emphasis of the judiciary being isolated. It is a very independent branch of government. These judges are appointed, once approved by the Senate, uh, are in office for life. And this allows them to kind of deflect political criticism of some of the decisions that they make. The staggering of terms, obviously the House is a two-year term, the Senate six, President four. The staggering of those terms allows for some protections as well. So we may have a president of a different party in 2016, the Republican Party, uh, but we also may have a change in the Senate to a Democratic control of the Senate, which it is not now. So the staggering of terms, two, four, six, um, kind of slows down the process. You don't have every branch of government being reelected every four years. So it makes it more difficult to have 
a carte blanche overturn or an entire governmental overturn from one party to another. And again, this is kind of a safeguard so that you don't have a group of people or a movement all of a sudden, all of a sudden overtake the entire government. Tenth Amendment limits government at the federal level extensively. So the Tenth Amendment, of course, says whatever, whatever powers aren't given to the federal government are left to the states, this idea of limited government. Even more so, the Bill of Rights allows for citizens to have defined rights, although not always clear in the Constitution, that the government, government, see, I told you I was rattled, the government cannot usurp meaning they cannot take away those rights. Now, you could do that if they pass a constitutional amendment, but that hardly ever happens. So the Bill of Rights is probably the hallmark of the Constitution. It defines, albeit not clearly, the rights of the citizens. And the courts ultimately determine when government agencies, whether it be state, local, school, federal, have you know, overstepped those rights. Free and fair elections we talked about earlier, the idea that anyone can run for election, but as we know, um, individuals need a little bit of money, so I'm not quite sure that we have truly free, some might argue not even fair, elections. Judicial review, and we talked about Marbury Madison in many of my classes today in the past few days, is the idea that the courts ultimately determine whether the other two branches have, I'm not quite sure what term I'm looking for, I want to say spit in the face of the Constitution, but have made decisions that are unconstitutional or violate your constitutional rights as citizens. Marbury versus Madison, of course, is a key case, and I like to always italicize Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison is the case that determines whether or not, uh, in this case, Congress passed the Judiciary Act of 1789, which defines some of the powers of the judicial branch, whether or not they have done something unconstitutional. And in that ruling, they ruled that the Congress did violate separation of powers by trying to define what the courts could do, the judiciary branch could do, but more importantly, by making an interpretation of the Constitution, it's the first time the court actually interprets whether or not a government entity has violated parts of the Constitution. Because they were able to do that, they established this principle of judicial review, that the courts in the Constitution, it's not clear, that the courts have the ability to determine when government entities have violated aspects of the Constitution. Marbury Madison, the most important case in the history of the Supreme Court. Without it, we don't have any of the other cases. So you need to know that case. You need to know it well. I will see you tomorrow. Hopefully I'll be in a little bit better of a mood. Uh, Mr. Dowdy doesn't get rattled too often. Have a good night. Peace.